Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, today we will be discussing on inborn errors of lipid metabolism. Now before we start on with the discussion of inborn errors of metabolism, we actually need to know what are the lipids, what is their metabolism, how do their metabolism bring about a defect. Now in the beginning, lipids are certain organic molecules which are insoluble in water but they are soluble in polar solvents. Lipids serve a large variety of functions starting from forming a part of our cells. They also act as hormones, they also act as bile salts, they are essential components of plasma membranes, they also supplement energy needs and many many more different functions. There are multiple disorders that affect how lipids are metabolized in or how fatty acids are broken down. The disorders affect affecting the lipids are can be classified into two types lipid storage disorders and fat oxidation disorders. Now if we look at the lipid storage disorders, there are two types known as acid lipase diseases and sphingolipid metabolism associated disorders and the other sort of disorder or the other class of disorder is disorders affecting oxidation of fatty acids. Now let us first have a look at the disorders affecting sphingolipids. Now what are sphingolipids? Sphingolipids are belonging to a class of lipids called complex lipids. Now as we know that lipids have generally a fatty acid group and an alcohol group. Now in cases of sphingolipid, the alcohol is sphingosine which is an 18 carbon amine alcohol and the fatty acid could be any fatty acid. There is no limitations on the specific type of fatty acid. Now this sphingolipids are basically serve a large variety of function but their basic function is they are present on the cell membrane and they help us to respond to an external stimulus or in certain cases they help to insulate the cell membranes. Now looking at the structure of a, phospho, of a sphingophospholipid, it is made up of an alcohol called sphingosine and a fatty acid together which combines to give us what is known as a ceramide which is the basic structural unit of a sphingolipid. This ceramide can be converted into another compound known as sphingomyelin by adding what is known as a phosphate and a choline group. This ceramide can also be converted to a galactocerebroside by converting a galactose residue or to this galactose residue a sulphate group can be added forming a cerebroside sulphated. This ceramide can also be converted to a glucocerebroside by adding a glucose molecule and this glucose molecule the moment one glucose, one extra carbohydrate moiety is added to a existing carbohydrate moiety, it is no longer as a cerebroside, it is known as a globoside. So by definition cerebrosides will have one glucose molecule or one galactose molecule or for that matter one monosaccharide unit whereas if there are more than one monosaccharide units it is known as globoside. So in this picture we can see that from, from glucocerebroside by addition of one more galactose we get globoside. This globoside can be converted into an ganglioside by the addition of nana or n acetyl neuraminic acid. So from one globoside that contains glucose and galactose if we add a n acetyl neuraminic acid or nana we get GM3 ganglioside. To this GM3 ganglioside if I add N acetyl galactosamine, I get GM2 ganglioside. To this GM2 ganglioside, if one more galactose is added, then I get GM1 ganglioside. From the globoside that contains the glucose and the galactose, if one more galactose is added, I get a different variety of globoside, or else if I add the sec N acetyl galactosamine, I get one more variety of globoside. So, you see. In this way, we can synthesize different types of sphingolipids. Starting from the ceramide, we keep on adding the carbohydrate residues based on the different carbohydrate residues or different moieties attached, we get different type of sphingolipids. 
Now generally this phengolipids are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi complex and they are enriched in the plasma membrane where they bring about their function. Generally there is no disorder affecting their biosynthesis but there are certain disorders that affect the, the breakdown of this sphingophospholipids. Now let us have a look at the disorders that affect the sphingophospholipids. Now the disorders of sphingolipids generally are certain disorders which affect the degradation that is happening in the lysosomes. So, if I have to say where is the site of degradation? The site of degradation of sphingolipids is the lysosome where it comes into the lysosome after it has been enriched into the plasma membrane and have done their function. They are retransported back into the lysosome through the endolysosomal pathway. There are certain lysosomal hydrolases that are responsible for breaking down the sphingolipids. Now, let us have a look at the different enzymes that are responsible for breaking down the sphingolipids. If we have a ceramide from to break down a ceramide into its individual component that is sphingosine and fatty acid, we need the enzyme ceramidase. So, ceramidase acts on ceramide to remove the fatty acid. In a similar way, sphingomyelin can be converted into ceramide by using the enzyme sphingomyelinase wherein it removes the phosphocholine group from it and gives back ceramide. In a similar way from galactocerebroside, ceramide can be obtained by removing the galactose residue using the enzyme beta galactosidase or the other name is galactocerebrosidase. From a sulfatid, I can get back the cerebroside or the galactocerebroside and then I can further break it down to ceramide. So, the enzyme that is responsible to convert a sulfatid into a galactocerebroside is known as aryl sulfatase A which removes the sulfate group. Now, there are certain disorders which are seen when this biodegradation pathway is affected. So, if there is deficiency of the ceramidase enzyme, then I have a disease known as what is known as Farber's disease. The characteristics of Farber's disease are painful swollen joints. In addition to that, hepatomegaly is also seen and hepatocellular dysfunction is also seen. By hepatomegaly, we mean enlargement of liver and hepatocellular means dysfunctioning of liver cells. In addition to that, chronic lung disease is also seen in this patients affected with Farber's disease and death is generally from progressive neurological deterioration, there is failure to thrive. If there is deficiency of sphingomyelin, then we get the disorder niamen pick or niamen pick disorder. The characteristics of niamen pick disorder are mental retardation, neurodegeneration, hepatosplenomegaly that is enlargement of both liver and spleen is seen and in addition to that a very unique characteristic of niamen pick is presence of a cherry red spot on the macula. Again in this niamen pick also there is failure to thrive and death generally occurs within 3 years of age. If there is deficiency of the beta galactosidase enzyme, then we get Krabs disease or the disease that is caused is Krabs or Krabbe's disease. In this case, <coughs> There is feeding difficulty that starts by the age of 3 to 6 months. There is profound demyelination and developmental arrest. Now, Krabs disease or Krabbe's disease belongs to a specific class of disorders known as leukodystrophies where there is problem with the formation or normal maturation of myelin. In addition to that, there is imperfect growth or developmental delays. In Krabs disease, death generally occurs by 18 months of age. If there is deficiency of the enzyme aryl sulfatase A, then the disorder that is caused is known as metachromatic leukodystrophy. The symptoms of metachromatic leukodystrophy are almost same as the Krabbe's leukodystrophy syndrome that is there is developmental arrest in addition to that there is problem with myelin formation. Now, there are three varieties of metachromatic leukodystrophy, infantile, juvenile and adult onset. Infantile form which is the most common accounting for 50 to 60 percent is very, very severe. Untreated generally die by the age of 5 years. In cases of the juvenile form, it is a little lesser or a less more less severe form wherein the major symptoms being mental retardation or dementia death generally occurs by 10 to 15 years and in adult onset the ad onset generally occurs in the fourth to fifth decade of life and the symptoms being psychiatric symptoms or dementia and the generally life expectancy is a little more as compared to the infantile and the juvenile onset forms. Now, let us see about the other disorders. 
if uh, there is GM1 ganglioside which is formed by the combination of ceramide with glucose, galactose, N-acetyl neuraminic acid, galactose and N-acetyl galactosamine that can be converted into a GM2 ganglioside by removing the galactose. This GM2 ganglioside can be converted into GM3 ganglioside by removing the N-acetyl galactosamine. The enzyme required for removal of N-acetyl galactosamine is known as hexosaminidase A. This GM3 ganglioside can be converted into a globoside by removing the N-acetyl neuraminic acid by the enzyme neuraminidase. This globoside can be further broken down into the glucocerebroside by removing the galactose, en galactose using the enzyme beta-galactosidase and then this glucocerebroside can be further broken down to ceramide by removing the glucose residue using the glucocerebroside. Now, if there are certain enzyme deficiencies as seen in cases of deficiency of hexosaminidase A, it will cause a disorder known as Tay-Sachs disease. The major clinical symptoms of Tay-Sachs disease are lysosomal with an onion skin appearance, there is CNS or central nervous system degeneration, there is presence of cherry red spots on the macular densa and death generally occurs by 4 years of life. If there is deficiency of the glucocerebroside enzyme, then there is no breakdown of glucocerebroside. There is accumulation of glucocerebroside. It causes a disease known as Gaucher's disease, where the cl major clinical symptoms are hepatosplenomegaly. The lysosomes have a wrinkled tissue paper appearance. Again, there are three subtypes, type 1, type 2 and type 3, whereas type 1 being the most common and the least severe type, where nervous system is not affected and type 2 being the most severe severe where nervous system is profoundly affected and type 3 being a little less severe than type 2 with neurological manifestations but not to that great an extent as we see in type 2. Next, we come to the other globocytes that were there, the degradation of globocytes. One so globocyte was that we saw was formed by the addition of galactose to glucocerebroside. From there, we saw that two more globocytes can be formed by sequential addition of one more galactose and one more N-acetyl galactosamine. Now, the breakdown is exactly reverse of their biosynthesis process. So, from one globocyte that contains the glucose, two galactose molecules and N-acetyl galactosamine, I can obtain the globocyte that contains only one glucose and two galactose by using the enzyme hexosaminidase A and B, wherein N-acetyl galactosamine is removed. That can be further converted into the other the parent globocyte which had only two carbohydrate residues that is one glucose and one galactose by the enzyme alpha galactosidase A which removes the galactose residue. Now, if there are any deficiencies in exosaminidase A or alpha galactosidase it causes two more disorders. If there is deficiency of alpha galactosidase A it causes Fabry's disease. The major clinical symptoms are peripheral neuropathy especially in hands and legs. Then there is angiocarotid that is purple blemishes on the skin, cardiovascular and renal disease is both are seen and in cases of deficiency of hexosaminidase A and B, we see Sandoff's disease. Now, the symptoms of Sandoff's disease are exactly similar to Tay-Sachs disease that is lysosomal skin <coughs> lysosome with onion skin presentation, CNS degeneration and there is cherry red spots on the macula. But the only difference in Sandoff's and Tay-Sachs is in Tay-Sachs there is deficiency of hexosaminidase A, whereas in Sandoff's there is deficiency of both hexosaminidase A and B. Now, whatever be the disorder of a sphingolipid, now one thing that we need to keep in mind is wherever there is an enzyme block, the accumulating substance is just the precursor of that particular substance. So, if there is a problem in Sandoff's disease, that means the globocyte that contains the uh, the glucose, the two galactose and N-acetyl galactosamine would be accumulated. The basic pathology behind this disorders is this accumulation of this substances causes increase in the lysosomal size and that increase in lysosomal size might cause a rupture of the lysosomal cells. Now, coming to the next set of disorders known as Woolman's disease and lysosomal 
ester storage disease this are caused due to the deficiency of one particular enzyme it is just based on whether the enzyme is completely deficient or partially deficient we have two different sorts of diseases in wolman's disease there is complete deficiency of lysosomal acid lipase now where is this lysosomal acid lipase used lysosomal acid lipase is used in degradation of cholesterol inside the cells so if there is deficiency of lysosomal acid lipase there will be accumulation of cholesterol within the lysosomes now coming to the first disorder wolman's disease there is complete absence of lysosomal acid lipase with calcification of adrenal the other symptoms being hepatosplenomegaly and failure to thrive death usually occurs within 6 to 8 years of age and if we look at the cells of the tissues affected the cells are generally loaded with neutral lipids like cholesterol and triglycerides coming to the next disorder cholesterol ester storage disorder which is due to partial deficiency of lysosomal acid lipase that is there is some residual activity of lysosomal acid lipase and there is no calcification of the adrenal glands although liver enlargement is seen but that might be the only symptom that is seen for the first few decades of this disease followed by which there might be abdominal pain and there might be liver fibrosis which might be seen there is marked elevation in plasma hdl so this are the disorders that are known as lysosomal storage disorders or lipid storage disorders which are generally two types sphingolipid storage disorders and acid lipase disorders now next we see fatty acid oxidation disorders before we go on to fatty acid oxidation disorders we should know how are fats oxidized only then we'll be able to understand how are basically oxidation disorders affecting now any fatty acid which is present within the cytosol of a cell is first activated by converting it into fatty acyl coa this fatty acyl coa Uh, can have two fates depending on the number of carbon atoms if the number of carbon atoms are more than 22 or it is branch chain then it first enters into peroxisomes where it undergoes initial oxidation known as alpha oxidation the basic purpose of this is to shorten the chain why because the basic other metabolism pathway that we have of oxidation happens within the mitochondria but that has a limit to the number of fatty acids so the mitochondrial oxidation of fatty acids can only happen if the fatty acids are shorter than 18 to 20 carbon so if there are fatty acids which are have a higher carbon number they have to be first entering into the peroxisomes to make them shorter and then this shortened chain length can enter into the mitochondria now we know in mitochondria there are two membranes the outer mitochondrial membrane and the inner mitochondrial membrane now this fatty acyl coa is shortened are easily capable of entering into the outer or are capable of crossing through the outer mitochondrial membrane but there is slight permeability issues within the inner mitochondrial membrane so they remain in the inner mitochondrial space now if the fatty acids are generally short chain or medium chain fatty acids that is having less than 6 carbon or having carbon number between 8 and 12 they can easily cross through the inner mitochondrial membrane and reach the mitochondrial matrix but if the number of of fatty acids or number of carbons in the fatty acids is slightly more than 14 to 20 or to 14 to 18 in that case they are unable to cross through the inner mitochondrial membrane for them we need a specific transporter or a specific mechanism so what is that mechanism the fatty acyl coa is basically long chain fatty acyl coa is they combine with a substance known as carnitine this is catalyzed by the enzyme cat cat1 more specifically cat1 stands for carnitine acyl transferase 1 which combines fatty acyl coa and carnitine and gives out acyl carnitine and coenzyme a coa sh here stands for coenzyme a this acyl carnitine which is formed in the inner mitochondrial membrane crosses the inner mitochondrial membrane and enters into the matrix and through a transporter 
and once it is inside the mitochondrial matrix, it is acted upon by the second enzyme CAT2 or carnitine acyl transferase 2, which exactly does the reverse of the reaction that was catalyzed by CAT1. So, in this case, acyl carnitine combines with coenzyme A to give back fatty acyl CoA and carnitine. This carnitine, which is reobtained into the mitochondrial matrix, is immediately transported back into the space through the same transporter. Therefore, the transporter does an antiport mechanism that it, it takes in one acyl carnitine and brings out one carnitine. Therefore, the name of the transporter is acyl carnitine carnitine translocase. So, once the fatty acyl CoA goes into the mitochondrial matrix, then this fatty acyl CoA enters into a process what is known as beta oxidation. In this process, what this fatty acyl CoA is acted upon by the enzyme fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase, which converts it into enoyl CoA. This enoyl CoA in subsequent steps gets converted into acyl CoA and acetyl CoA. Acyl CoA having two carbons less from the parent fatty acyl CoA that it started with, the two carbons are being converted into acetyl CoA and released at every step. The acetyl CoA will enter into the TCA cycle to give me energy and then the acyl CoA will re-enter into the beta oxidation pathway and will be broken down sequentially with removal of two carbons at every step. Now, based on the total number of carbons in the fatty acid, the acyl CoA dehydrogenase enzyme can be of three types. Either it can be short chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase or medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase or long chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase. Now, what is the importance of this is? Now, we know what are the participating factors in fatty acid oxidation. So, next when we learn the fatty acid oxidation disorders, it becomes clearer for our understand. Now, the first deficiency that is there is carnitine deficiency. If there is inadequate amount of carnitine obtained through diet or there is deficiency in order to synthesize carnitine or carnitine is not reabsorbed from the primary urine filtrate, in all cases we are going to have carnitine deficiency. So, if there is deficiency of carnitine, there will be problems with transport of long chain fatty acids. Now, why is this problematic? Because the dietary <coughs> fatty acid which is present in adults is predominantly composed of long chain fatty acids. So, if long chain fatty acid is not metabolized, then the adult individual will start suffering from deficiency of glucose. Why? Because glucose would be used preferentially since fats are not being utilized for energy. Therefore, the major symptom that we see is hypoglycemia. In addition to that, since this fatty acyl CoA is long chain fatty acyl CoA will accumulate, we might see hepatomegaly also and there would be intolerance to exercise. If there is deficiency of carnitine translocase, that is in such cases where there is adequate amount of carnitine that is there in the body, but there is deficiency of carnitine translocase enzyme, then the defect is much more severe. It is a life threatening condition with cardiac problems. The major symptoms are hypoglycemia which might lead to coma. In addition to that, there is hepatomegaly and there is muscle fatigue and muscle damage with prolonged exercise that is seen. So, this are if there are no transport of fatty acyl coase into the mitochondria. What if the my fatty acyl coase are transported into the mitochondria, but then the corresponding enzyme required to break them are, is deficient. So, those disorders that we see are known as MCAT deficiency disorders that is medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency or long chain very long chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. So, first we will see medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. The symptoms of that are hypoglycemia, cardiomyopathy and it is very common. It is generally associated with a disorder called sudden infant death syndrome or short form SIDS which is characterized by episodic attacks that happen between the first 6 to 24 months of life following a fasting of 12 hours and characterized by hypoglycemia which might lead to seizures, which might lead to coma and death. The reason for this is the diet in a newborn child is predominantly milk. Milk is made up of short and medium chain fatty acids, medium chain fatty acids being much more in comparison to short chain fatty acids. 
So, if there is deficiency of medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase, the child will not be able to obtain any energy from milk as a result of which it will start using more and more glucose as a result of which glucose levels will drop much more faster leading to a hypoglycemia which might lead to neurological manifestations like vomiting and seizures which if untreated or unchecked might lead to coma which finally might lead to death. Coming to the next set of disorders, very long chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency or VALCA deficiency. Generally, it, there are three forms of it, the severe form, milder form and the late onset form. In cases of severe form, there is cardiomyopathy, hypoglycemia and generally death if untreated and the death happens in infancy only. Whereas, in milder forms, there is hypoglycemia and hepatic dysfunction, whereas in late onset, there is muscle fatigue and damage on prolonged exercise. Now, coming to two other disorders known as Refsum's disease and Zellweger's disease. Now, before going on to the Refsum's and Zellweger's, I would like to point to the fact that we saw in the previous slides that long chain fatty acids and branch chain fatty acids have to undergo a preliminary oxidation in peroxisomes followed by chain shortening which will also happen in the peroxisomes and only after that they are capable of entering into the mitochondria. So, the next two disorders Refsum's disease and Zellweger's disease are associated with defects in peroxisomes. So, let us see what is Refsum's disease. Refsum's disease is due to a deficiency of a particular enzyme called phytanoyl CoA hydroxylase deficiency. Now, where is this utilized? This is utilized in the breakdown of phytanic acid. Phytanic acid is a branched chain fatty acid. So, it has to be first going into the peroxisomes to be broken down initial alpha oxidation followed by which it can enter into the mitochondria. So, if this enzyme is deficient due to any deficiency in the peroxisomes, in that cases phytanic acid would not be broken down. So, this is known as a peroxisomal biogenesis disorder or there is problems with peroxisomal biosynthesis. There is accumulation of phytanic acid in plasma and the clinical symptoms being vision loss and loss of sense of smell which is called anosmia. So, these are few clinical symptoms of Refsum's disease. Next, we come to Zellweger's disease which is caused due to a reduction or absence of functional peroxisomes. The major clinical symptom is there is a reduction in myelin synthesis and hepatomegaly. It is autosomal recessive caused due to a mutation that is seen in the normal assembly of peroxisomes due to deficient peroxin proteins the tissues and cells start accumulating very long chain fatty acids and branch chain fatty acids since peroxisomes are responsible for breakdown of those particular fatty acids. As a result of which there is accumulation of this particular branch chain and very long chain fatty acids. Now, in Zellweger syndrome, there is also affected brain development and neuro, neuronal development. All of this could be associated with reduction in myelin synthesis. Thank you.